Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Excellent. So today we continue our series where we go through the first five books of the Bible. Over 16 weeks, we are taking a whistle-stop tour of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. We're doing this because those books are foundational to the Bible. They are the... There a second. They are the foundation stones of the Bible, of which everything else is built on top of. They introduce us to the stories, to the ideas, to the characters that come back again and again throughout the Bible. Now, for those who are reading along using the Immerse Beginnings book, uh, you'll know that we have reached or are reaching the end of Genesis, and we're starting the story of Exodus. And we're going to be right at the beginning of that story today in Exodus 3. But before we go into that, let us take a moment to think about the idea of names. So everybody here has a name, I'm pretty sure anyway, and your name means something. Okay, your name is not a random sound plucked from nowhere. It has a meaning. And parents often think of what those meanings are and what associations that name has with it before they pick it. So my name, for example, is Tim. Tim is short for Timothy, which is from the Greek word Timotheus, meaning honored by God. Okay? So Timo means honored, and Theos means God, Timotheus. Appropriately, Fola, who's sitting at the back, hey Fola, uh, who's my new wife, by the way, was it like a, I think it's one month, one week, so yeah. Um, her name means crown of honor. So I'm honored by God, and she is crown of honor. So I think that works quite well. Um, on TV, there are some names that you recognize are going to come up. And I'm going to see if anyone here knows what those names mean. So, Sean, could you put the first name up, please? First name is Derek. Okay. Derek, do you know what your name means? Leader. You are absolutely correct. It means not just leader, but gifted ruler or people ruler. There we are. Um, Stuart, your name next comes up. What do you think your name means? <laughs> Does anyone know what the name Stuart means? Sorry? It means, it's, it's literally just another spelling of the word steward, which means an administrative official of an estate. Um, so you're a secretary, essentially. <laughs> it means secretary. Okay, so are you good at admin, Stuart? Yeah, okay, cool. Um, the next one is Ruth. Mum, do you know what your name means? Anyone know what Ruth means? Oh, do you know what it means? Is that because you listened to this sermon this morning when I was practicing? Okay. (laughs) I think it probably is. It means friend. But it's actually a little bit more complicated because there are two origins of the name Ruth. It could be friend or it could be compassion. Hence Hence the word ruthless means without compassion. Okay? They are connected. So you could say it means compassionate friend. But we'll just go with friend for now. Uh, the next one is Eamon, who's not here today. But Eamon, does anyone know what Eamon means? Val, you're here. Do you know what Eamon means? It means wealthy protector. Yeah. <laughs> wealthy protector. And our final name is here, and it is Adrian. <laughs> Adrian, do you know what your name means? It means from the river Adria. Okay, uh, which is, of course, in not far off, not far off. So the, the River Adria, unfortunately, um, dried up 2,000 years ago. But, okay, <laughs> it was near Rome, okay? Uh, it gave its name to a few things, including the city of Adria, now called Atri, I think, um, and it gave its name to the Adriatic Sea, okay? So your name and the sea have the same um, sort of backstory. But... It also gave its name to the Emperor Hadrian. And it turns out that Hadrian is just another spelling of Adrian that's been passed down over the years. So technically speaking, you could call it Adrian's Wall. So there you are. There's your your fact for today. Um, Adrian's Wall. So this week, we're going to be chatting about some names, and we're going to think about why names are important, because we're thinking about God's name, the name that God gives us in the Bible to call him by. So I'm going to read a bit of the Bible, Exodus 2, uh, verses 23 to 322. It's a big chunk of the Bible, so to keep you interested, I have a task for you as I'm reading it. 
I would like you to find out the bit where God tells us his name. And I would like you to take note of what God's name is. Okay, and I will test you afterwards. Some of you will know what's coming, but some of you won't. So after this, I'm going to ask you, what does God say his name is? So Exodus 2, 23 to 3, 22. Years passed, and the king of Egypt died. But the Israelites continued to groan under the burden of slavery. They cried out for help, and their cry rose up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He looked down on the people of Israel and knew it was time to act. One day, Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses. Here I am, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering, so I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites now live. Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abused them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh, and you must lead my people Israel out of Egypt. But Moses protested to God, Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? God answered, I will be with you, and this is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this very mountain. But Moses protested, If I go to the people of Israel and tell them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they'll ask me, what is his name? Then what should I tell them? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my eternal name, my name to remember for all generations. Now go and call together all the elders of Israel. Tell them Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to me. He told me, I have been watching closely and I see how the Egyptians are treating you. I have promised to rescue you from the oppression in Egypt. I will lead you to a land flowing with milk and honey. The land where the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites now live. The elders of Israel will accept your message. Then you and the elders must go to the king of Egypt and tell him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. So please let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand forces him. I will raise my hand and strike the Egyptians, performing all kinds of miracles among them. Then at last he will let you go. And I will cause the Egyptians to look favorably on you. They will give you gifts when you go, so you will not leave empty-handed. And every Israelite woman will ask for articles of silver and gold and fine clothing from her Egyptian neighbors and from the foreign women in their houses. And you will dress your sons and your daughters with these, stripping the Egyptians of their wealth. So that's relatively a long reading from the Bible, is the story of the burning bush. Some of you guys will know it. Um, or have heard of the idea of this burning bush in the middle of a desert where uh, God appeared to Moses. That is the story from the Bible uh, as it is told there. 
But let's check who was listening. Who there caught God's name? He gave a name. Did anyone catch it? Well, you got a hand up? Verse, verse 40 or 14. Uh, yes, I am who I am. say I am. Yep, I am uh, 14. I am who I am. Absolutely. What did you say, Derek? Yahweh. Absolutely, yes. So I am who I am or Yahweh. Okay? So they're connected. So I am who I am is the name of God translated for us. It's what it means. But if you were to actually say it in Hebrew as best as you can, you would get something like Yahweh or Jehovah, which is where those names come from. Okay, so if you ever hear the names Yahweh or Jehovah, that's where it's coming from. It means I am who I am. But you won't see it written many places because most Bibles are actually afraid to print it. They will simply say Lord instead. So whenever you see Lord in the Bible, it probably means Yahweh. Okay? But they're afraid to print it just in case they accidentally do something wrong with the name. I picked one that wasn't afraid because obviously I've got to make the point. So, Yahweh means I am who I am. Now, as you can imagine, theologians and scholars love that answer because it is really, really vague. Okay? So they can write books about it, they can write essays about it, and they can debate about it all day. But generally speaking, I'm just going to bring all what they've thought and just summarize it in a couple of sentences for you so you don't have to read all those books and all those essays. Um, unless you want to, in which case I can recommend some really boring stuff to you. Okay. Um, God is someone who is unique. He is someone who cannot be defined by reference to anything other than himself. He simply is who he is. He stands alone. He is not relying on anything else. He simply is. He is the only thing that doesn't need defining because he is the original. Okay? Everything afterwards has to justify itself. He doesn't. He is who he is. I am who I am. That is what it means. Okay? Which brings us to a really interesting and contradictory thing about this passage. Because you see, God doesn't just say, call me Yahweh. That's often what we take from this passage. And that's often what people and theologians debate. But it's not actually what he says. He actually says, call me Yahweh, the God of your ancestors. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He says he wants to be called Yahweh, the God of your ancestors. God, this unique being, this independent being, chooses to describe himself by referring to his people. He stands alone. There is nothing like him. But he goes, I am the God of you. He takes his people and he puts that as part of his identity. It is how he identifies himself to his people. So the name of God is not just simply Yahweh. It is Yahweh the God of your ancestors. This wonderful, this holy God, this God that's so perfect that Moses can't even approach him beyond where he does at the beginning of the passage, has chosen to call himself by the name of his followers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. So who is our God? Well, the answer to that question is Yahweh, the God of his people, the God of us. He is our God. He is the God who in chapter 2, verse 23, hears the cry of his people as they suffer. He is the God who has bound himself to his people by covenant, so much so that it stirs him to save them when they are enslaved in Egypt. He is the God who calls Israel my people, something that has never, ever happened in the Bible up until this point. He says, those people are mine. And God is clear that he's not sending Moses into this battle alone but he's going to be with him. It is him that is going to save Israel, not simply Moses. This is Yahweh, the God of his people. Egypt does not stand a chance, for God has heard the cry of his people, and he will save them. That is what's going on in Exodus 3 and the end of Exodus 2. Now, I have another task for you, okay? Uh, Four questions are going to appear on the screen behind me, okay? I'm going to read out a Bible passage, and I'm going to get you to do a little bit of work again because I don't like to have to do all the work. You guys are going to tell me, using this Bible passage, what is the answer to those four questions. So the questions you need to pay attention to are, what type of person does Jesus compare himself to? What does Jesus compare his people to? What is the difference between a good shepherd and a hired hand? And what is the connection between this passage and Exodus 3? 
So I'm going to read out a passage. It's much shorter this time, don't worry. And I'm then going to ask you to tell me the answer to these four questions. Okay? If I don't get volunteers, I will pick on people. So pay attention. Okay? So these are the words of Jesus from John 10, verses 11 to 18. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. A hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. He will abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him and he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's working only for the money and doesn't really care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me, just as my father knows me and I know the father. So I sacrifice my life for the sheep. I have other sheep too that are not in the sheepfold and I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice and there will be one flock with one shepherd. Father loves me because I sacrificed my life so I may take it back again. No one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily. I have the authority to lay it down when I want and also to take it up again. This is what my Father has commanded. So, what type of person does Jesus compare himself to? A shepherd. He is the good shepherd in this, okay? What does Jesus compare his people to? Excellent. So he is a shepherd, we are the sheep. What is the difference between a good shepherd and a hired hand? Absolutely. A bad shepherd, a hired hand, runs away when the going gets tough. But Jesus doesn't do that because he is a good shepherd. A shepherd who loves his people and is committed to his people. He does not run away when the going gets tough. Um, it, I'm going to be very impressed if you can summarize this in, by shouting out one word, but what's the connection between this passage and Exodus 3? Anyone got any idea? John, you, you've got an idea? He is a provider, absolutely. I am whatever my people need. That is a wonderful phrase. That's a great I am saying. I am whatever my people need. Absolutely. Okay. In John 10... Jesus touches on a lot of the same ideas as Exodus 3. So the language of John 10, 11 to 18 has Jesus lovingly call himself his shepherd. He will care. He will give his people what they need. He shows that he is willing to do that even to the point of dying for them. He will not run away. He is committed to his people. It is an intimate picture. It is Jesus declaring that he cares deeply about his people, deeply about you. Okay? And just like God in Exodus 3, Jesus is associating himself with his people. He has picked a description for himself, which defines himself by his people. A shepherd is defined by the fact that he has sheep and looks after them. And he has chosen to say, I am the good shepherd. As God in Exodus 3 defines himself by saying, I am the God of your ancestors, Jesus says, I am your God, your protector, your shepherd. He defines himself by his people. And that makes sense because Jesus is God. They are one and the same. He is Yahweh on earth. And we know this because Jesus regularly takes the I am language from Exodus 3 and uses it all over again in new and wonderful ways. He uses it to say, I am a good shepherd in that passage. But he also says elsewhere, I am the bread of light. I am the light of the world. Um, I am the door for the sheep. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I am the true vine. He uses the I am to tell us about himself. He says, I am God, and this is how we are connected. You are my people. And he uses various analogies and metaphors to make that make sense. And the great thing is here, he presents this picture of himself as gathering his sheep under his protection, of rescuing like wolves. He will fight for us even to the point of giving his own life just as God was gathering the Israelites out of Egypt, was caring for them, and would fight for them. Now, if there's one thing that I lack sometimes, it is a sense of commitment. I am someone who starts many tasks, and I make many promises, but I don't always have the commitment to see them through. I'm sure many of you have an example of when I've done this for you. Um, But take pity on poor Fala, okay? I've been married to Fola for just over a month, and I think she's gradually becoming aware that sometimes I lack commitment to everyday tasks. I do not lack commitment to her. 
okay? Committed till my dying day. But to everyday tasks, I sometimes wander off and don't finish, okay? So I'm not that committed, say, to finishing tidying my study, which I said would be done by the end of the week, but um, <laughs> it hasn't been. Um, I am not that committed to ensuring that she got some of the chocolate cookies that I brought home, rather than just eating them myself, which I have now done. Um, and I lack her commitment to artistically placing cushions on furniture. I, I don't understand why she does it or what she wants to achieve. Um, now, earlier today, as I mentioned earlier, I did actually test out this sermon on fire just to see if it was all right. Um, and she decided that she wanted to make some additions to this section. Um, yeah, so there's a small, there's four things she wanted to mention. Um, she said, I'm also not committed to cleaning in general, okay? Making sure the bedside cabinet is not covered in dust. That was a really particular one for this morning. Hoovering the floor, which I am now going to be doing this afternoon, and allowing her to have a decent night's sleep. Um, <laughs> yes, so I think she was in a bad mood when she woke up, I don't know. But we are very, very fortunate, are we not? Well, God's commitment is not like my own and not like our own. God's commitment is far more reliable. Because God's commitment to his people, God's decision to associate with his people, was not hollow. He is the good shepherd. He does not run away. He actually comes through with his promises. We see that in Exodus because God did go on to save his people, to free the slaves. And we know that Jesus did too because he gathered in his people because you're here right now. Okay? God is committed to his people. God associates with his people. And he actually follows through. And that is the wonderful thing that begins to be revealed in Exodus 3. The truth is that I find our God utterly remarkable because he is the God who chooses to commit to us, to associate with us, to care for his flawed, broken people. Even though he doesn't need to use us to define himself, he chooses to anyway. So who is our God? Well, I can look at the Bible and I can say he is Yahweh. He is the God of Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Rebecca, Jacob, Rachel, Joseph, Ruth, Hannah, David, Hezekiah, and many more. I can look at the New Testament, I can say our God is Yahweh, the God of Mary, Elizabeth, Peter, John, Paul, Priscilla. But I can also look out here and I can say, who is our God? He is Yahweh, the God of Derek, the God of Stuart, the God of Ruth, of Amon, of Adrian, and of countless people in this church called Paul. Okay? He is our God. And when his people cry out in pain, he hears it. When his people are suffering, he knows it. And when you cry out to him, you are his people, so he hears you. When you are suffering, you are his people, so he knows it. And he knows exactly the time to act. Yeah, it took 400 years for the Israelites for the time to come for them. But when it did, mighty Egypt fell before the power of the Lord. And when the time is right, he will act in your life. And you know something really exciting? God has not finished calling his people home. There are still sheep to be gathered in. There are still people out there, trapped in slavery, people that God has chosen for himself, people who God has appointed to be saved, people who God will draw himself just as he drew each and every one of you. Walking past those doors right now, there are people that God has labeled for himself, people that he will call to him, people who he will give a right standing because of the work of Jesus before him and who he will glorify. God will free his people for slavery, from slavery. That is true thousands of years ago in Exodus 3. That was true in the New Testament. That is true now. God will protect his sheep and he will gather his flock. Yahweh, the God of his people, will save them. God is deeply committed to you. He hears you. He calls you. He is with you. And we can rely on him to protect us all the days of our lives because he is building something big and something wonderful in his people. Could the band please come back up? In Exodus 3, verses 23, to chapter 3, verse 22, God reveals his commitment to and his identification with his people. Let me very quickly share with you three ways that this might affect your life today. 
Um, these are not the only three ways, but there are simply, simply three ways I thought this might have an impact. First, remember that when you pray, God does hear you because you are part of his people. Tell him about your pain and your suffering. He cares about it. Do not hide it from him. He is your God. He is Yahweh. And when the time comes, he will act. Second, remember that God is committed to his people, so we should also be committed to his people. Let us love the church. Let us love our brothers and sisters. And let us be committed to them and to their well-being. And finally, and thirdly, there are empty chairs in this room today, which one day will be filled and they will be filled with individuals who do not yet know that God has prepared a place for them here. And that is exciting. It's part of our privilege is we get to go out there and be the people to find them and bring them in, to help in the gathering of the flock. Let us pray together. Father, Yahweh, we come before you and we thank you that you have revealed your name to us. You are the great I am. There is nothing like you. You are unique. Yet the great I am has chosen to be with us. You are Yahweh, the God of his people, the God of us. We thank you for this and pray that we might remember it.